Hello, my name is Evan Hayfley. I'm a professor in the History Department at Texas A&M University, and today I'm going to talk to you about the Age of Discovery, uh, the discovery of America, and the phenomenon known as first contact, which I think is the real beginning of American history when Europeans and Native Americans first encountered each other, setting up the basis of interactions between the Americas and peoples around the world that is the essence of American history. Now, by many accounts, indigenous Americans in these first encounters fundamentally misunderstood Europeans, thinking they were like gods. In other words, there's an idea that there was a big cultural misunderstanding or confusion at the beginning that got things off on the wrong foot between indigenous Americans and Europeans that then contributed to a lot of the misunderstandings and conflicts that followed with the European colonization of America. There's many images of Europeans' first encounter with Native Americans, in which Native Americans are generally shown to be surprised or in awe um, <clears throat> of the Europeans. Now, it was certainly a surprise for them to have people come in uh, from the sea over horizon over which they had never seen anybody come from before and never expected anybody to ever come. Still, it's worth reflecting a little bit more on what was really going on in this moment um, and why we remember it the way we do. Since this was, I think, the moment when American history really began, how we think about this moment really sets up the whole story of American history. History books usually focus on the European side of the story, what the Europeans did, what the Europeans wanted, what Europeans said, um, and Christopher Columbus is rightly recognized as the man who first established contact, or lasting contact between Europe and the Americas after he landed in the Bahamas in the fall of 1492. Now, this bias towards the European side of the story is partly because Europeans eventually became the dominant group across the Americas, but it's also mostly because Europeans produced and preserved the primary sources that are our main way of accessing this history. We just know a lot more about them and what they were doing. Columbus's voyage was part of what is generally known as the Age of Discovery, the era from the 1400s to the early 1700s uh, when Europeans sailed all around the world, mapping it, connecting it, and analyzing it. It starts with European explorers sailing down the coast of Africa to Asia and ends with explorers in the Pacific. None of these guys were doing this for fun. These Europeans were looking for places where they could trade or places that they could colonize. And eventually, by around 1900, uh, or 400 years after Columbus's voyage, uh, Europeans from Portugal to Russia had claimed control over most of the entire globe. Even China was carved up into European spheres of influence. So I think it's fair to say that the whole idea of discovery means something very different for Europeans and their descendants around the world than it does for everyone else who was part of the group of people who were discovered. One of the things I like about the idea of first contact and why I think it's exploring in more detail is that it provides a way for us to get at and think about these two different historical perspectives that of those who did the discovering and that of those who and benefited from it and that of those who were discovered and generally did not have such a good experience afterwards. Some people prefer to just miss the idea, just, just dismiss the idea that anyone could be discovered by anyone else, but I think it's important to recognize that this has been and continues to be part of the way that people think about and talk about this history. It's part of the reason why Columbus, Columbus Day became a holiday in the United States and also why many people, especially indigenous Americans, want to rename it Indigenous Peoples Day. So thanks to European sources, we know that Christopher Columbus initiated the permanent colonization of the Americas by establishing the Spanish in the Caribbean. His encounters with the people there have become the archetype of the first contact moment because they are the one time we know where everybody on both sides of the encounter ex uh, um, had no uh, expectations about what would happen. The Lucayans who were living in the Bahamas had no idea that there were other people living across the sea. Um, <clears throat> indeed, many Native Americans, uh, especially in Eastern North America, called the continent they lived on Turtle Island because they believed the earth had been created on the back of a giant turtle floating in a vast uh, 
sea, and that was the extent of the world as they knew it. They knew nothing of Europe, Africa, or Asia. Likewise, Christopher Columbus and his crew knew nothing about the Americas. They thought they were going to Asia and had no idea that there were two whole continents in the way. Now, Columbus was pretty savvy about public relations for his time, and so to convince everyone that he had actually made it to Asia, he called the people he met Indios, or Indians. And that became the generic name for all the peoples living in the Americas ever since. They might have had nothing to do with each other. They could be completely different kinds of people in terms of their language, culture, and social structure. But now they were all Indians. Now, one of the interesting things about Columbus is he never really accepted the fact that he had discovered a new world. He made three other voyages in the service of Spain, but he kept thinking that he was getting closer to China or maybe even for a little while, the Garden of Eden. And one of the th fascinating things about Columbus is that he wasn't, uh, he wasn't a fool. He was a very well-educated man who knew about as much as you could possibly know at that time about the world beyond Europe. And I think that was part of the problem. He had so many ideas of what he should be encountering that he could not come accept the idea that he had run into something completely new and unexpected. It took other explorers to realize that. And so we know these lands as America from the name of another Italian explorer, Amerigo Vespucci, who sailed to America a few years after Columbus and realized that this was not Asia, but something new and different. For that reason, when Europeans first put the New World on the map, they gave it the name America and not Colombia. Even though Columbus did not quite realize that he had discovered America, his voyages were very important because they gave the Spanish monarchy the basis for its claim to territory in America uh, under European law. Europeans justified these claims by the so-called doctrine of discovery, um, <clears throat> which dates back to the days when Europeans and Spanish um, explorers started sailing out into the Atlantic and encountering new lands that uh, had been completely unknown to Europeans until then. The Pope, uh, claimed that they could conquer and control any of these new lands as long as they were not inhabited by Christians or already claimed by a Christian prince. Now, since the Pope in these years was the head of the European church, uh, <clears throat> and he was also the closest thing to some sort of international institution for all of Europeans. So this doctrine applied to all European Christians, the Spanish, the French, the Dutch, the English, as they went overseas and encountered new lands, everywhere from Sub-Saharan Africa to the Americas, Asia, and even Australia. So in this context, Columbus's voyage is not just the beginning of the history of America, but part of the global history of European expansion. Other explorers provided the basis for other imperial claims in America. John Cabot staked a claim to America for the English. Jacques Cartier did the same for the French. And Henry Hudson, even though he was English, but was employed by the Dutch, staked the claim to the Dutch for the Dutch to North America by sailing up the river that is now uh, named after him. The claims that these countries were able to make on American land as a result of these voyages is the main reason these voyages are important. In the short term, they didn't make anyone rich, um, <clears throat> uh, but they did provide a pretext for claiming these lands. Another effect of these encounters is the way that they created a group of people that we now refer to as Native Americans or indigenous people, which is the term used for people living in places around the world that were eventually taken over by European colonists who settled on their lands in large numbers, displacing the original inhabitants, um, who either died out, moved away, or were pushed to the margins of colonial society. <clears throat> this is typical of the history of many countries in the Americas, especially the United States, but also some other countries elsewhere like New Zealand. Nowadays, uh, some people refer to this process as settler colonialism to distinguish it from the kind of colonial, uh, ha colonialism that happened in other places like Nigeria or India or Vietnam, where the native inhabitants were not displaced by European settlers. Here's where the idea of first contact becomes important because only indigenous people had a first contact experience. Indians in India, the Chinese, the Japanese, and other peoples who already 
lived in large, powerful societies that were well connected to the wider world had a very different experience. When Europeans first showed up, they were just one of a bunch of very different people that these societies were used to dealing with. They already had ideas, customs, laws, and strategies for dealing with such strangers. Indigenous people did not. They did, of course, have their own network of trade and exchange, but they were more local and not as extensive as what existed in Asia. They also did not involve people who looked so very different and possessed radical new technologies. Instead, <clears throat> once Europeans showed up, they had to figure out how to respond to these new people in a new way, while also drawing on their own cultural resources. Now, for a long time, Europeans and their descendants have believed that indigenous people, Americans, mistook Europeans for gods, that they foolishly mistook a bunch of sailors for divine beings. That misunderstanding, some say, led indigenous Americans to welcome Europeans into their territory, setting themselves up for great disappointment once they realized that Europeans were not gods, but very greedy humans who wanted to colonize their land and exploit them to get rich quick. This story is often presented as a sort of morality tale, one that highlights the innocence and naivete of indigenous Americans, sometimes to the point of painting pre-contact America as a kind of paradise that was destroyed by Europeans. There's something very Christian about telling the story this way. It's sort of a modern version of the myth of the Garden of Eden, an earthly paradise ruined by humankind's sinfulness. That similarity makes it very compelling story for many people because it is such a familiar kind of story evoking ideas and feelings that people have already been exposed to through Christianity. Thus, this discovery of America has long been portrayed as a moment of great religious significance for European Christians. However, that image is not a great way to start American history off especially if we want to understand the indigenous side of the story. This is a very Christian European way of understanding what happened um, that reduces indigenous Americans to the margins um, and, and represents them as a rather simplistic stereotype. In this case, like that of the noble savage, who was a good, peaceful Indian who's at one with nature. Now, yes, Native Americans' relationship with nature was not as exploitative as that of Europeans, but this stereotype of the noble savage denies indigenous Americans their humanity and their diversity by portraying them as naive and clueless about Europeans and their technology. This is something that goes back to the 16th century when images of European explorers in America emphasized that it was their technology, their ships, their navigational instruments, their weapons, and their clothes. Notice how often Native Americans are portrayed naked or almost completely naked, as opposed to the Europeans. <clears throat> and that these technical, technological and cultural differences have long been seen as part of what made Europeans superior to Native Americans and helps explain the success of the colonization of America. Now, portraying Native Americans as innocent and naive can heighten, this, can heighten the sense of outrage one might feel when they are exploited by Europeans. However, it also contains, constrains Native Americans according to a limited set of expectations. Because if they do not live up to the stereotype of the noble savage, then they're either deemed not truly Indian or they are slapped with the counterpart of the noble savage stereotype the cruel, warlike, or brutal savage. This is the one who violently resists and attacks Europeans. These two stereotypes are two sides of the same coin that is applied to all indigenous people and has been ever since Columbus first showed up in America. They continue to crop up in the ways people talk and think about indigenous Americans, even in some history books today. Indigenous Americans are either noble savage stereotypes who are spiritually and morally superior to Europeans, or they are brutal savage stereotypes who are uncivilized, unreasonable, cruel, and violent. Not the sorts of people one can negotiate or coexist with. These stereotypes prevent us from seeing indigenous Americans as they were, as regular people with all the complexity and range of possible motives and deeds that we allow Europeans to have. We know from the Europeans' the sources that some people tried to befriend them and others attacked them, but there were a range of other responses as well, 
mostly involving people who wanted to trade with the Europeans. And that wasn't always easy because the Europeans were not always reliable trading partners. They could be friendly, but they could also be very suspicious and even violent. In other words, their actions were not all that different from that of Native Americans. But for some reason, we only have these stereotypes about the indigenous people and not about the Europeans. To overcome those stereotypes and start thinking about indigenous Americans as regular people, just like Europeans, we need to change the way we approach American history from the very beginning. The first step in doing so is to find ways to get the indigenous American perspective on the events and to try and understand how they thought about what was going on and why they reacted the way that they did. We need to think our way out of the old Christian European habits that have long dominated this history and into indigenous culture. That's a tricky thing to do because for most of early American history, we do not have many sources representing indigenous American perspectives. Even when we do get indigenous American perspectives, they tend to be recorded by Europeans or their descendants <clears throat> because until the 20th century, those were the people who were the major primary ones recording and storing and preserving historical sources that we use to reconstruct the past. The biggest exception to this trend are indigenous oral traditions. Most indigenous Americans, especially those in the territory that later becomes the United States, were oral societies. Their histories, laws, culture, everything was passed down through stories and sayings that people had to memorize. Now, until recently, historians did not take these sources very seriously, saying they were not as reliable as actual documents from the past. However, scholars have shown that if we are careful, we can learn a good deal from these oral traditions about what happened in the past and especially how indigenous people understood those events. Now, oral tradition does not work like a, like a book or a regular historical source. It doesn't remember specific details like exactly how many people were involved on what day or exactly what was said. Nobody can remember those kind of details for generations. <clears throat> Instead, what gets passed down are more refined memories that trim out a lot of the extraneous details and focus on the most important and memorable things. This process is what makes oral traditions valuable for understanding indigenous American history. It's not so good at telling us exactly what happened or when, especially when it was a long time ago, like during the age of discovery, but it is good about telling us about what it meant for indigenous people. And one thing that I have found is that many different groups from all across the Americas, from Canada to down to Latin America, had stories about their first contact with Europeans. And we know this because as soon as Europeans began talking to them, indigenous Americans began telling them these stories. So one of the first, one of the really interesting things about the whole idea of first contact is that it's less of a European idea and more of an indigenous American one. The very fact that we think about this event as something special that happened is because that is how indigenous Americans described it. However, we have to look more closely at their stories and put them in their cultural context before we can really understand what they mean, meant. To begin with, Indigenous Americans assimilated the strange new things they saw to things that were familiar to them. They had never seen ships like what the Europeans had before, so they described them as floating islands. The masts were like trees. One story from northern Canada describes them as floating ice, probably because of the large white sails. Or maybe it was some sort of a sea monster, or perhaps a canoe as large as an island. They had also never seen Europeans before. And the men on those ships had several qualities that really struck indigenous Americans as strange. First, they were very hairy with beards and mustaches, some of it curly, some of it straight, and none of it cut or braided in the ways that Native Americans did with their hair. Second, Europeans hair and eyes came in different colors. Unlike indigenous Americans who generally had black hair and brown eyes, Europeans had black, brown, blonde, and red hair, their eyes were blue, gray, green. The only creatures that were very hairy and had colorful eyes that indigenous Americans were familiar with were bears, wolves, and dogs. 
So some of the stories describe Europeans on their ships as a bunch of wolves or bears climbing up and down trees on a floating island. These were all things that indigenous Americans could relate to, but what was happening was still really very strange. The next thing that appears in these stories is that the first people to see the Europeans quickly spread the word to their community and around their country. We can see some evidence for this in the European sources who describe many people coming to see them. Some accounts describe debates taking place among the community's leaders over how to respond and the uncertainty and confusion about what to do. One thing that confused indigenous Americans about the explorers was that they were all men. For indigenous people, the only time you had groups of men traveling by themselves without women was when you were out hunting or going to war. The Europeans with their ships and their technology, all of these things were clearly new, but they were not gods, not gods in the European sense. Here it is good to remember that when indigenous Americans told these stories, they did not tell them in English or any other European language. They told them in their own languages, with their own concepts, and they did not have any idea of God or gods similar to that of European Christians. True, when you look at the words that they use to describe Europeans in their first contact stories, they tend to use words that are later translated to mean God in the European sense. But that's a change that European missionaries brought to the language much later on. When they first told these stories, they were not Christians. So they were not thinking in the ways that Europeans did, even though their stories would get translated into those languages and concepts later on. To illustrate this, I will focus on one word used by many people in eastern North America all up and down the coast from what is now the southern United States up to Canada. It is Manitou, a word that now is often translated to mean God or gods, but before the arrival of Christian missionaries, it meant someone or something that was just more powerful, talented, or skilled than the normal. Roger Williams, who lived for years with the Narragansett people of today's Rhode Island, uh, and learned their language, wrote a book called A Key into the Language of America, in which he translated Manitou as God. But if you look closely at the examples he gives, it's clear that that is not exactly what it meant. William noticed, quote, a general custom amongst them at the apprehension of any excellency in men, women, birds, beasts, fish, etc., to cry out a Manito. That is, it is a God, as thus they as thus, if they see one man excel others in wisdom, valor, strength, activity, etc., they cry out Manito, a god. And therefore, when they talk amongst themselves of the English ships and great buildings, of the plowing of their fields, and especially of books and letters, they will end thus, Manitowak, they are gods. Cum Manito, you are a god, etc. Now, one way we might translate Manitou today is amazing or extraordinary. It's something that could be about a person as much as a thing, like a ship. It is not a supernatural build, building, being, or essence, but something that exists very much in this world, something that makes people or things more powerful than they normally are. <clears throat> Another difference between indigenous and European ideas is that indigenous people did not have European Christians' habit of classifying everything as either good or bad. So we have God who's good and the devil who's bad. Words like Manitou did not refer to something inherently good or bad. It could be either or it could be both, which is why sometimes it is translated as God and sometimes as devil. The key thing for indigenous people was not the inherent quality of something that was Manitou, but rather in the relationship you had with that thing. And for American, indigenous Americans, relationships were always reciprocal with Manitou as much as with people. If you wanted something that was Manitou to be your friend and ally, then you would treat it kindly and offer it gifts, hoping and expecting to receive kindness and gifts in return. That is exactly how things turned out sometimes with Europeans when they traded objects with indigenous Americans. However, if you did not establish a good relationship, Manitou could become dangerous and deadly. That is also exactly how things turned out at other times when Europeans killed or captured indigenous people. <clears throat> 
This idea that it was essential to establish a relationship with Manitou also helps explain one of the main things you see in these first contact situations over and over and over again, <clears throat> which is that almost always indigenous people went out to meet and greet these newcomers. Some people fled and ran away, but most of them did not because they knew they had to confront whatever it was that was coming. Otherwise, things could turn out even worse for them. After Christianity arrived, the indigenous words first used to describe Europeans, like Manitou, were translated into God or devil, which made it seem like indigenous Americans were misunderstanding the situation and did not have a realistic way of conceiving of the Europeans and what they were up to. However, if we understand these, word in more, these words in more indigenous terms, we can see that they, were very, they knew very well what was up. Of course, they'd never been to Europe and didn't know exactly what was coming after the first explorers arrived, but they knew that this was something new and important. And they knew that these, cre these were creatures who could really help them out by bringing them new knowledge and new technology, but that they were also very powerful and dangerous beings who could do them great harm. Indigenous people were not naive or innocent. Their ideas about Manitou were just very different from how Europeans thought about things. Europeans were used to dividing the world into separate spheres of gods and men or good and evil. Indigenous Americans understood that these, words were, these worlds were not separate and that all of these things coexisted together. The same Manitou that could help you could also hurt you if you failed to sustain a good relationship with it. This idea worked very well for describing the actual Europeans that they met and what happened after they encountered them. And I think it's for that reason that indigenous people were so intent on telling Europeans these stories because they knew from the very beginning that something new and potentially very dangerous was about to happen. And that's exactly how things turned out.